So hey everyone, uh, welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. Today we're doing something kind of unique, which I'm really excited about. We're gonna show you science that you can do at home uh, because we have an expert at uh, science uh, displays, Dr. Tay. So we're really excited to have her here today. Um, I am gonna be hidden for most of the talk so that you get more screen time with all of the excellent science that you can do at home from stuff that you probably have in your kitchen right now. So um, generally, uh, a little bit of background about Skype a Scientist, if you're not familiar with us. We are a nonprofit organization that tries to bring science to as many people as possible in many different ways. And uh, during the pandemic, of course, we've been running a lot of live streams. Um, tomorrow, we're gonna be talking about vaccines. On Wednesday, we're gonna be talking with a marine biologist who works at uh, the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. Um, and then on Friday, we're going to be talking about mountains and how mountains are created and how we study them and how we could even find like things that used to be at the bottom of the ocean way at the top of mountains um, with Stacy Phillips, who is so engaging and wonderful. So that'll be another one to get excited about. But everything we're doing this week is going to be great. So um, that is pretty much all I have before handing it over to Dr. Tay. Um, other than that, if you can support our program, please do. You can do that at paypal.me, paypal.me slash Skype a scientist or um, patreon.com slash Skype a scientist. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, so um, any donations that you make to us are tax deductible in the United States. Um, that's it for me. So, uh, Dr. Tay, would you like to introduce yourself, say who you are, what you do, uh, why you like it, maybe how you got here, and then, um, actually, you have a whole thing ready for us, so I'm just going to be quiet and, uh, <laughs> and watch. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Hi, everybody. I am, my real name is Dr. Latasia Jones, uh, but everybody calls me Dr. Tay. And I have been a scientist for about 13, 14 years. And I've studied anything from cells, which is that basic part of you know, the human body that determines the traits and characteristics of how you develop to looking into diabetes. And I spent the majority of my research years actually in neuroscience. So I am very, very, very enthused by science. I love science. And today I just wanted to share a few things that I like to do from home, um, which is number one, educating the youth by using stuff at home that could teach science and little fun experiments to um, you know, anything from going to schools and doing these same experience, experiments and so on. I love, love, love science. I love being at a research lab and I love learning more about science, but my favorite thing to do is teach kids how to experience the fun in science from their own homes. So that's what I'm going to do today. All right, is everybody still, are you still here? Because the screen is frozen. I'm here. You sound good. Okay. You look good. Um, Perfect. Now, when we get to the question and answer, answer period, I have this up on my phone, so I'm not going to be able to see the questions. So let me know when those come through, okay? Yeah, I will um, verbalize the, the questions to you. Okay, so I have two experiments today. And like I said, these are things you could do from home. There's plenty more things that I am finding out for myself that I could do from home as far as experiments and fun science. And my YouTube channel is Hey Dr. Tay, H-E-Y space D-R space T-A-Y. And I literally just go in my kitchen each day and I film myself doing these fun experiments from home so that way you can learn to do the same thing as well as learning the science content behind it. So I have two experiments for today. I'm going to show you how to make a lava lamp as well as make rainbow volcanoes. So let's get started. For the rainbow volcanoes, the only things you'll need are food coloring, which you see here I have orange, red, blue, and green. You'll need some baking soda, a spoon, of course, to dish out the baking soda, and then vinegar. And the good thing about this experiment is you'll learn a little bit about acids and bases and acid-base reactions. Um, if you don't know already, acids are those substances or um, solutions or just some type of liquid or what chemical that basically donates hydrogen ions bases accept those hydrogen ions. So when you put them together, you have this interchange 
between each other as far as those the hydrogen and the chemical reaction is set and it reacts and it cre it's created by that mixture. So we're going to do that in the rainbow volcano experiment. And it's basically going to show you in a colorful way how you made your own acid base reaction at home. And yes, I know this is very like close to making the rain, the volcano that you may have done for like middle school. But I think it makes it a little bit better when you know what you're doing and you kind of make it colorful as well. So the first thing you want to do is add your baking soda to your clear containers. And I'm going to add about two spoonfuls. Mind you, I make a mess every time I do these experiments. So I always make sure I have like the little dollar store table cloths, the plastic one on my counter to make sure the mess can just be folded up and thrown away instead of having to do too much of a clean afterwards. All right. And this is just regular baking soda that you can get. It's the off-brand that you can get from Walmart or any other convenience store. So another good thing about these experiments is I'm not spending hundreds of dollars to do them. Excuse me. The first one I'm going to set with the green food coloring. So about three to five drops would be okay to get your color out. The next one I'll probably do red. I really like red on a lot of things. And then the last one, let's add blue. And I'm a colorful person, I like colors. So food coloring is very important in my experiments and it's very close to what you do in real research labs. So I've done a lot of what's called cell immunofluorescence, where you're looking at the microscope at any types of cells. I've studied anything from neurons in the brain, which are the cells that send chemical responses so if you put your hand on something hot those neurons activate and they tell your brain hey take your hand off of that hot item because it's burning you i studied those neurons by putting a certain color inside of them so i could see them more vividly under our microscope so this is a good part of doing the experiments from home because you're using that same tactic using the color to see what you're doing in your experiment a little bit better and then the last thing we're gonna do, so now that we have the baking soda in there, the baking soda is your base. The last thing we're gonna add is your acid, of course. Inside of vinegar is acetic acid, and that's what's going to react with your baking soda. So remember I did green, red, and blue. Let me move stuff, I am very messy. So to be cautious, let me not make more of a mess than what I need to. One, two, Three. So now we have activated our acid base reactions. You now know that when you add your base to your acid, it creates this type of reaction because of what's going on between the chemical bases of them. There's hydrogen donation and hydrogen acceptance that's going on. So that interchange between those two plus a, a few other details, of course, it creates this reaction to occur. But not only does this reaction occur, but you didn't have to go to a chemistry lab to do it. And the worst thing that can happen is you make a mess and things smell like vinegar for a while. So that is the first experiment that I wanted to show you all today that you could do from home with things in your house. The second one, as you remember, hopefully, we're gonna set up lava lamps. And with the lava lamp experiment, you're learning a few different things. So with this one, we're gonna add water to oil inside the same container. And if you already know, you know that water and oil do not mix. The only time you can make it partially mix is if your water is very hot. And we're gonna use cold water today. So one of the essential principles that's based off of is the fact that it's hydrophobic. Oil is hydrophobic meaning it will not mix with the water well. So I am going to first pour water into my containers. And I wanna do two because I wanna explore two different colors just in case any of you out there are biased and wanna see one color more than the other. 
And don't worry, this is old. I filled these bottles up with water from the sink, so I'm not wasting water. The next thing you want to do is add your oil. And you could do baby oil, which is clear, but it makes it a little bit better if you have an oil with some type of color to it. So I'm just using vegetable oil, which is this yellowish color. Um, that way I could see the difference between my oil and my water. And as you can see already, when I pour my oil into the water, you see that bubbling effect where they're not mixing well? That's that hydrophobic property. Basically saying, hey, I'm not mixing with this water at all. And it's essential for this lava lamp for them not to mix because when we add the food coloring, food coloring is water soluble. So you don't want it to mix with the food, the oil. The next step, we're just gonna add food coloring at this point. And for this one, I think I'm gonna choose the orange and the green. Green is my favorite color, by the way, so I use it a lot. So about five drops of the green here. And let's do five of the orange. Came out looking a little red, so I hope it actually looks orange once it's done. And then the last thing we're gonna do is set off a reaction. And just to make sure everybody understands a reaction is what occurs when you mix two things together. For this particular thing, we're going to add an acids to the water. And any, if you've ever had an acid, or I have airborne. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever had like an airborne before they get on a plane or go somewhere just to make sure their immune system is working properly and to its best before you get into any different environment. When you put the an acid or the airborne into water, it does a bubbling effect, sort of like when you open up a soda can. That bubble effect is the carbon that's produced. Carbon is one of the elements on the periodic table that is shown or comes out in that air or gas-like phase when you put the antacid into the water. So just gonna break it up into a few pieces and I'm gonna add it to my lava lamps. And as you can already see, is giving off this bubbling effect. I'll move it closer just in case. And here we've made now our lava lamps. And you have one in your orange and one in your green. I actually like it better in orange than I like it in green. But I'm glad I did it in both colors so you can see. And once again, things that you can find at home. A lot of people already have the antacids. And most people have water and vegetable oil of some type or some, it could be canola oil, just the oil that's a different color at home. So these are just two of the experiments out of many that you could do from home using stuff that you already have at home. Um, another thing that I wanna share with the lava lamp experiment, as you can see now, the experiments have actually like fizzed out and they're almost complete as far as the bubbling effect. If you add another, it just restarts the experiment again. So that's the fun thing with this. It's kind of like the gift that just keeps on giving because it keeps going and going every time you add another antacid or whatever else you add that does the bubbling effect. So that is it for my presentation on experiments. I would love to answer any questions regarding science or what I do to help uh, communicate and teach the kids in science. So let me know. Awesome. Thank you. Um, our first question is from Randy. Is there anything that you can use uh, to replace the baking soda with in this experiment that you might have around the house? Hmm. That's a good question. I haven't tried anything else around the house. I, Randy, can you email me at heydrtay at gmail.com? H-E-Y-D-R-T-A-Y at gmail.com. And I could find some substitutions for you. Hopefully I could find something. Um, but kitchen wise, this is usually the only thing that I've used base wise in the kitchen. I could look for some other things though. Possibly, yeah, I'll look into other things before I give you an answer. I don't wanna give you a wrong answer. So I'm gonna look into it first and send you an answer, okay? If you email me, you have to email me though. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, Kayla would like to know, uh, what about denture cleaner tablets? Could you use that? Uh, to put into your lava lamp experiment? 
So the denture, if I'm not mistaken, it has hydrogen peroxide. Um, if she can answer that back, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have dentures. I've never had dentures before. <laughs> um, the tablets though, if I'm not mistaken, they have hydrogen peroxide in them, um, kind of like the basis to some of the, the toothpaste. Um, but let me know if so, that may be a completely different reaction. So the hydrogen peroxide, it, it gives off the same type of reaction as far as releasing the bubbles and that gas-like form, the gas comes out from the reaction. I'm just not sure that that's what's gonna happen when it mixes with water. Because if I'm not mistaken, water, hydrogen peroxide has water in it as well. Um, so it's not gonna have the same reaction when you combine it with water because it's already in it. Um, hydrogen peroxide with yeast though, yeast mixed yeast water is a basis of elephant's toothpaste experiment. If you go to my YouTube channel, Hey Dr. Tay, I have the experiment, elephant's toothpaste, where I use hydrogen peroxide and I mix it with yeast water that's warm and just a little bit of dish detergent and food coloring. And it makes like a toothpaste appeal, but it's, in, it's a big quantity. So it looks like it's the toothpaste for elephants. So if you have hydrogen peroxide in that, you may be able to use that for a different experiment, but check the ingredients on the cleaner. Awesome. It has um, citric acid and sodium bicarbonate, she says. Okay, um, so it may, it actually may work. Cool. If it does, if it has those ingredients, it may work. Tell her to try it. Um, put it in water first and see if it does the reaction first. Because um, if it's just added to water to give off that bubble effect, then it definitely will work with this because that's all I did here was give it off um, the bubble effect. And if I'm not mistaken, that citric, uh, both of those ingredients are inside of the alka seltzer as well. So yeah, it should definitely work for this. Awesome. Um, let's see. So why? Uh, when you add the vinegar to the baking soda, you said it was an acid-base reaction, but where do the bubbles come from? So that's released from the actual reaction, from combining them. So you have a few th different things going on. You're neutralizing the acid, you're bringing it down to be closer to basic, but not completely because the base is being brought a little closer to acid here, right? So it's this fight or this tug of war for a balance between the two. And as a result, because of that mixture, that bubble effect or the bubble result comes off of your reaction. So that's just, uh, a lot of us call it like, that's the results of the reaction, meaning that's what we observe as an effect from the mixture itself. Um, but that's basically what's occurring. You're, the baking, what's in the baking soda is missing with what's in the, at the um, sorry, what's mixing in the vinegar and it's creating that bubble effect. Great. Um, for the rainbow volcano, does the water have to be cold? Rainbow volcano. So the rainbow volcano has no water in it. Oh, right. So does the uh, vinegar have to be cold? I just use room temperature vinegar for the rainbow volcano. So it, no, I, I actually never put vinegar in the refrigerator or anything. Um, somebody tell me if that's like a bad thing to not do. <laughs> but um, I just use I just use regular room temperature uh, everything for everything. The only thing that you would really have to be careful about is the water that you add to your lava lamp. Like I said before, if it's warm or hot, it'll kind of break down the oil and try to allow the both of them to mix together versus staying separate from each other. And that's why when washing dishes or something, you would use hot water or warm water to wash your dishes, especially the greasy ones, because you want to break down the oil. But here, you don't want the oil and the water to break down. You want them to stay separate from each other so your reaction could, be, could occur properly. Awesome. Um, is the uh, volcano reaction an exothermic or endothermic reaction? So it would be exothermic because it's giving off of energy. Awesome. Um, Parker would like to know, can you use uh, lemon and baking soda to make a fizzy drink? Yes, you can. You can use lemon and baking soda. It's basically the same type of reaction as here, except you're using the acid inside of the lemon instead of using the vinegar. So, yep, you could um, use the lemon and baking soda to give off that same fizz appeal. Awesome. Um, let's see. How much oil did you put in this experiment, and are there any instructions to your experiments on live, online on your website at all? 
So as far as instructions, if you go to YouTube at Hey Dr. Tay, H-E-Y space D-R space T-A-Y, you'll find me and I have the video for the lava lamps already up there that'll give you the full instructions on how to do it from beginning to end. But as far as how much oil versus water, you want to have less water than oil. So what I usually say is about one part oil, I mean, one part water and two parts oil. But as you can see, sometimes I'm off for the sake of not opening the second bottle and just saving it for later. Plus, I already knew it was going to work with this amount. I just have a little bit more oil than water. Um, you don't want to have less oil than the water because a lot of the reaction actually occurs within the oil as far as giving off that bubble effect. And then the colors mixing is very important, just for visual purposes. So you want to have more oil than water for this. But you want to have enough water where the reaction even just starts. Because as we said before, the acid won't give off the reaction if it's not added to the water. Awesome. Thank you. Um, do you like your job? Is it fun? I love my job. I've learned so much in the past like 13, 14 years. And there's things that I've done that I never would have imagined from, I've traveled to Greece, I'm sorry, I traveled to Germany to su support some research and find collaborators and present my work. I've also gone to a few different schools to present my work. I've, when I was living in Florida, I was constantly flying to Chicago, DC, and you know, just other places pr to present my research, as well as the things that I learned in the lab. I've gone from looking at microscopic worms, worms that you cannot see with the naked eye. I had to use a microscope to view these worms to understand cellular division and how that is, it impacts, you know, the possibility of you having certain cancers or tumor development to doing neuroscience research where I used rodent models and looked at the brains of like baby mice to understand how a child, a human child's brain develops properly or abnormally. So, you know, it makes you do a lot of different things that you never probably would imagine doing just in regular life, which is the most awesome part about being a scientist to me. I'm continuously learning and I, every day is an adventure. That's awesome. That's a really awesome part about being a scientist. Um, right. All that I would like to know, what degrees do you have? Ooh, <laughs> good questions. So my bachelor's is at, from Virginia State University in biology. My master's is from Virginia State University in biology as well, but my master's thesis was built off of micro, I'm sorry, um, molecular biology. And then my PhD is from, I earned it at Florida State University in the Department of Biomedical Sciences. So on my degree, it says biomedical sciences, of course, um, but my research focused on a neurological disorder and I use molecular biology techniques to understand it. So as far as the degrees, I have a bachelor's, master's, and a PhD. As far as my research experience and the sciences that I have, you know, experienced and enjoyed throughout this whole journey, I'm anywhere from like cellular development to molecular biology, regular biology, neuroscience, and maybe like um, disparities, health research, biomedical sciences, and so on. Awesome. Um, let's see. Um, how long have you been a scientist now? So I started my scientific journey in 2007. And funny story, I was a freshman in college, and I wanted to actually be an MD or a medical doctor and work with uh, pregnant women, so an obstetrician or a gynecologist. And I saw a flyer hanging up in the building of my biology department, and it said if you wanted to get your first laboratory experience at the College of William and Mary, sign up here, see this person, and da 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 da. And they were only looking for juniors and seniors. And as I said, I was a freshman. So after weeks and weeks and weeks of basically asking, hey, did anybody sign up? The advisor that was in charge of that flyer said, nobody signed up. And he gave me the opportunity to start my first laboratory experience that in the summer of 2007 in College of William & Mary. And I, I began being a scientist the, probably the first day I walked into that lab. So I started my scientific journey since 2007. It's now 2020. So I'll say about 13 years, a little over 13 years. Amazing. Um, that's exactly how long I've been a scientist. So I feel like we're in like hey. the same class. <laughs> um, hey. 
let's see, what is your favorite at home experiment? Ooh, good question. You know, the funny thing is, every time I do a new experiment, I say, oh, this is my favorite one now. So the last one I did was, um, well, the last two that I did, the one before was um, making a bouncy and naked egg. And like I said, go to my YouTube channel. It's Hey Dr. Tay, space between Hey Dr. and um, Tay. And it's H E Y space D R space T A Y. I made a egg naked and bouncy, like literally able to bounce the egg on the countertop just by dissolving the membrane of the egg using vinegar and incubating it for 48 hours. And this is not a, a boiled egg. This is a raw egg that had the shell on it and had never hit a pot, a stove, and hot water. So that was like my first favorite experiment. I know it sounds simple, but um, it's just something I had never seen before. And then the second experiment that I really like is the dancing rice experiment, which is coming out soon. Um, basically using the same thing, acid-base reaction, to see rice literally dance inside of a container in front of you. So I'll be posting that soon, that's coming out this week. But that every time I do a new one, it's like, oh my gosh, I had more fun with this one than any other one. <laughs> so that's awesome. it's, my answer is the more recent video, or the more recent experiment, it's always the more fun one. That egg one is totally amazing. Every time I see anybody do that, I oh my gosh. <laughs> shocked. It's so weird and so cool. Um, Adrienne wants to know, uh, yes. what's your suggestion <laughs> for engaging and motivating all students to be interested in science through relevant community-based science exper ex experiences? Right, so my biggest suggestion is always making sure that you keep up with the times when it comes to the age group. Anytime that I engage with the community or with a certain group of kids, I ask what ages they are. I kind of figure out what music they're listening to, what video games they're playing, what TV they're, they're looking at, and so on. Because kids really like things that are engaging, of course, but they also like stuff that relates to what they're already doing and keeps them more involved. So in some of my videos, I start singing a song or I'm dancing to like TikTok music from the TikTok videos you know, just to keep the kids in the community more engaged and make them understand, hey, this is a place where everybody is welcome. Because I think that is the biggest, I, I guess the biggest take back from all of this. Science is welcoming. Science is fun. Science is engaging. Science is, you know, educational. So if a kid can take that from it and they feel comfortable, just as comfortable as if they were playing a video game or dancing at a party with their friends, then they're going to want to do it more. So I try to make sure that environment or that atmosphere is instilled in whatever I'm doing, whether it's the YouTube videos, actually I, I have a few programs that I've started. So actually engaging with the kids physically, you know, through those programs or whatever else I do. When I go to the schools, I set up experiments in the front of my presentations when I give presentations at school so they can be engaged with the experiment and understand through the experiment, the joy of science. So just bringing it to them on the level that they would definitely respond to would be like the number one answer that I would give. Totally, that's, that's so important, thank you. Um, Gabby would like to know, what made you wanna be a scientist? Ooh, good question. My first lab experience was the big decision maker for me. Um, and then, of course, it was other parts of my life that said, hey, yeah, keep continuing in that direction. So my first laboratory experience, I was in charge of, you know, just understanding what these microscopic worms were doing, understand the cellular division in the microscopic worms. And uh, the first thing is like, I had never known there was even a microscopic worm. So, <laughs> you know, I'm looking at these things for the first time and it already had me excited. So that was the first part of wanting to continue with science, just the excitement of being in a lab, the excitement of looking at an organism I've never, I would have never seen if I continued to go MD route or something else. Um, and then I, throughout life, I took a trip to Ghana and I was teaching some kids in a classroom at Ghana. I was teaching them English, science, and math. And I realized that while I was teaching them the science, I was able to show them science in different ways that made it fun, fun for them. So that made me decide, hey, just keep going with the science, you know, because you may be able to do something bigger and better than what you've ever imagined before. So that actually made me decide to finish my master's and earn my doctorate. So 
just you know having fun with it and being excited about excited about it made me want to continue my path in science great um next question what are some of the challenges you might face as a scientist from tanya Ooh, good question so um, it really depends on your personality in a lot of situations um, collaborations or working with other labs or other people could be difficult at times um, just different personalities but that's anything right being in a team could be difficult so learning how to deal with different personalities and working towards each with each other's strengths as well as addressing any weaknesses and trying to find solutions for those things could be a challenge um, the biggest challenge that a lot of scientists face are like the time consumption and being a scientist. Sometimes I've seen myself in a lab from like 10 a.m. to 4 a.m. the next morning. And it was just to get certain things done because I wanted to maybe take a break another day or I was just so excited about how the research was going that I couldn't stop. So although it could be a challenge, you're getting results from this, you're getting data from this. And if you're really excited about it, it keeps you going and you don't even realize time is, you know, just flying by. So that could be one of the challenges for some people is just how long it takes. A lot of people say, hey, why haven't we cured cancer? Well, there's so many different types of cancers. There's so many different proteins. You have to understand what's going on. You have to observe it. Then you have to figure out what, how could you find a solution and you have to test all these things out, get data, get results show that it could be done over and over again, publish about it and so on. That's a lengthy process. So I would say one of the challenges is being patient, understanding that what you're doing is important and sticking with the science, no matter how long it drives out to be. Awesome. Um, Jackson would like to know, could you explain the reaction between Mentos and Coke? Oh yeah, so that's um, basically giving off carbon dioxide uh, reaction so your carbon is released as gas in that reaction and that's where the explosion comes from I really want to do that that experiment in my YouTube videos but I'm scared it's gonna make more of a mess than I want in my kitchen <laughs> so I be on the lookout though I'm gonna find some things that I'm gonna do in the kitchen and maybe like put a tablecloth or plastic on the ceiling or something to make sure that when it does explode it doesn't completely mess my kitchen up but that's Basically, it's just giving off that gas or that carbon dioxide that you would find inside of the soda or whatever else, but in a more explosive way. Cool. <clears throat> Sorry, what has been your favorite part of your career? My favorite part of my career is talking to other scientists, seeing how far I've come, and I, I really like the experiments. I really like the things that I, the new things that I learned in my research, anything from like doing surgeries to um, even just talking to the families that I impact. That's probably the most favorite part of my, my scientific career, being able to talk to families that have the disease that I'm studying. And they're telling me, thank you for, even if it's just a little bit of information that I'm able to provide, thank you for providing that information because you've helped me understand this or you've helped you know the research world with getting advancements in this understanding this disease cool um next question is how many uh people are on your team of scientists like do you work with groups of scientists or do you work alone so when i was in <laughs> when i was in every lab that i've been in so i'm no longer in a lab now I, um but i still work with scientists where i'm at and every lab that I have been in, it's been multiple people in the lab, but each person can work together. And sometimes they do work together, but usually they have a project that they lead on their own. So if I have three projects, maybe two of them, I work with other people on because they're able to contribute something that I don't have a skill base in. But one of them, I may work completely on by myself. So that's one important thing about science is sometimes in the laboratory, you can find people that are better at things than you are to contribute in those aspects of the research so it can be complete. Um, it's kind of like making a song. You may not be a lyricist, but you may be able to sing well or rap well. So you may find a lyricist that can give you the words and then you sing the words and then you have a complete song, right? Totally, awesome. What advice slash motivational message would you give to a student in elementary school who may want to pursue a career as a scientist? Ooh, 
Um, I would say while you're still young, keep playing with science from home. Keep looking at things that you like in science on TV, on YouTube videos or whatever else. And then just, just enjoy it as you can. Um, elementary school is still a bit young, but there's so many things you can do no matter what your age is. So keep doing the fun things. And when it comes to science, keep getting exposed to science. And then there's so many different science careers. Um, I'm hoping this is a parent or someone asking this question, but if it is a parent, hopefully just exposing the child to a lot of different careers, or if it is the kid, um, seeking ways to get exposed to those careers. So we have, I also have a, my friend and I have a show called Conversations Between Kids and Stemineers. And we have like a Zoom meeting with kids where, and it's something like Skype a scientist as well. Um, well, but it, I think it's a little different because we have just a sit down conversation on the couch where you could do show and tell, or you could do the hands-on activity with the kids. So a lot of the kids come up there just to see what does it mean to work at NASA or what does it mean to be an engineer or a scientist or this particular type of scientist. So doing those things and even just being here on Skype a scientist is showing you know you what it means to be a scientist. And right now you're learning a little bit about being a neuroscientist um, such as myself or even just engaging with the community as a scientist. Great. Um, let's see, do you remember the first experiment that you ever did? <laughs> yeah, my first experiment, oh, ever, like ever, like ever, ever, like middle school? <laughs> I don't remember the first experiment I ever did. I have no idea. Oh my gosh. So it would most likely have to be, okay, so I remember, as far as I can remember, I remember doing things like, um, an anatomy class and looking inside of animals to see what their anatomy was like or the digestive system. Um, as well as, oh, we did stuff with like Drosophila flies, the little, they almost look like gnats, where um, you feed them and you cross them together to see what genetics you can come out with using the fruit flies. Um, what other young scientist things did I do? When I was a kid kid, I think I did like, just look at insects and stuff. I wasn't like an animal animal person as far as lizards and snakes, but I did like dogs and um, anything that was furry. My favorite animal is koala. It's been a koala for a long time, elephants and like giraffes. So studying those and just understanding what they eat and how they react in their natural environment and stuff like that. I used to love Discovery Channel and stuff. So outside of school, that would be like what I would do, but inside of school, anatomy, experiments and then like looking at the atmosphere and growing stuff I, but my favorite one i would would say is my freshman or junior year of college somewhere in between there i had an experiment where we looked at different turtle species to see why one turtle species was out beating another and eventually was going to hopefully make one extinct in the virginia area so that was a really fun one awesome um one of the last questions we'll have time for is um, Ryan is asking, how did you get so smart and how did you know what science you wanted to do? Well, Ryan, thank you for thinking that I'm smart because um, <laughs> I think I'm just having a great day. Um, and what type of science, actually I never really knew what type of science I wanted to do. Um, I've always been passion driven. So anything that made me feel like I was helping humans was what I wanted to do. And it just happened that I ended up looking at cellular division, happened that I ended up looking at diabetes. And then the longest set of my time was looking into neurological disorders or disorders from the brain that could affect kids. So all these things I've always wanted to help out with, right? Because I want to help kids. I want to help humans with understanding these diseases, these disorders, and hopefully finding answers to them. Um, so I think that was the number one thing. And just a secret between all of us and, you know, me, I really never liked neuroscience. So it's actually very funny that I ended up in neuroscience because I never imagined being in neuroscience. I just thought it was so difficult. I didn't really think that it was interesting, but actually having my hands on an experiment and seeing people that were affected by it made it so much more interesting and so much at the same time for me. So I, I think that is the number one reason why I would say neuroscience was like 
what I actually picked because I stuck with it because it kept me driving, it kept me driving towards finding answers when it came to neurological disorders. Very, very cool. Um, cool. So it's now we've been talking for 40 minutes. It's been great. Um, we always end with the same two questions for everybody. One is what is one thing that you wish everybody in the world knew related to your area of expertise? And the second thing is what do you wish everybody in the world do related to literally anything? It can be as simple or significant as you'd like. Mm, good question. So my related to my expertise i would say that research takes time and you have to give research time i get it when you're on the outside you're and looking in you're always like where are the answers when it comes to the specific disease why don't we have a cure to cancer and scientists understand and we're working hard to find these cures and these answers but it takes a long time so that's the number one thing that i want people to understand when it comes to being a scientist and being in research all these things that we do in the labs take a long time in order for us to do it correctly. Um, and as far as just in general, science is fun. Uh, it's always gonna be fun. You just have to find the right people or the right, right ways to make it fun. So my favorite thing is hands-on activities. Uh, and every day I live through science being fun because of these activities. So hopefully you can learn that as well. Great. Um, okay, so where can we find you on uh, social media? Um, where, like anything else you'd like to plug? So I am on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube. And of course, I'm on LinkedIn as well. LinkedIn, I'm under my actual name, so Latasia Jones, L-A-T-A-I-S-I-A-J-O-N-E-S. And on everything else, I am Hey Dr. Tay, H-E-Y-D-R-T-A-Y. So make sure you follow, send an email. I have an email address, which is heydrtay at gmail.com. Let me know any of your questions, comments, or concerns. If you have any ideas of new videos you'd like for me to post on YouTube, let me know. We could even collaborate and do a split screen and do the experiment together and see what happens. So just let me know if you have, you're interested in any of those things. And thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us today. This was so awesome. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time. Erin, thank you for being here and signing for us. Um, everybody else, we uh, will be back here tomorrow, same time, talking about vaccines. Wednesday, also 1 p.m., talking about uh, marine biology in the museum. And then Friday, also 1 p.m., talking about uh, mountains. So um, if you can support our program, please do at patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist. Go follow Dr. Tay on all of those platforms. Um, and thank you for being with us today. And uh, we'll see y'all tomorrow. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.